You are listening to a sermon by Pastor Christopher Sally of New Life Christian Fellowship Church. Anytime you talk about Calvary, it's it's a subject you have to approach very soberly, very, very reverently, very seriously. Amen. Because we're speaking of the death, burial and resurrection of Christ. And so often it can just become, I don't know, routine to us. You know, we, we, we might not really understand the gravity of it because we do. We speak about it a lot. And sometimes when you speak about something a lot, you can, it can lose some of its, some of its value to you uh, in its familiarity. And I don't want that to happen to us. And so we can become numb to the details or understate the significance of it. Um, and I, I just, I, I just want us to just explore the subject of this view of Calvary. So there, there was a, there was a movie and I don't know how long it came out 10 years ago or something. I know it started Forrest Whitaker and it was called Vantage Point. And in this, and in this movie, there was an event that occurred, but you got to look at it from the vantage point of several stakeholders, maybe four or five different people and then when you were able to look at everything from the vantage point you were able to get the full story amen and so today i want to to look at there there really there are really eight stakeholders that are at the at the cross of calvary we're not going to get to all of them so if you're visiting with us here's here's what i'm going to tell you if you want to hear the whole message you're going to have to come back next week See, that's the hook. You see how I did that? See how I throw that bait in the water for you? Now let me get to as many as I can. My plan is to do the first five. And they do. They're good now. And I'm saving the best three for next week. But, but this, this idea of a vantage point, this view of Calvary, that there, there, were, there were people that were there or their, their vantage points that you can look at at Calvary and then you can get a full picture of really what's going on. And, and the first view that I want to, to, to you to understand is the view from the world. Just a simple view from the world. To the world, Calvary was spectacle. It's simply spectacle. It would be like having a reality TV show. That's the way I would think of it. It would be an event to discuss. It would be something that you could talk about at the water cooler because Jesus wasn't the first person that the Romans crucified. Matter of fact, on that day, they crucified three people. And so again, it would be like to the world, it was was just merely a a, a spectacle, something to to look at, something to talk about, something to be, uh, uh, to, 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 to react to that was visceral and, and, and it was it would it would have been great television is what I'm saying to you and 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 I recall when that movie the passion of the Christ came out did anybody see that that movie and we saw it and I remember seeing it in the theaters and I remember being shocked at the that the brutality that you would see visually in that and I thought about possibly showing part of the passion of the Christ, but I think it literally would overwhelm us in terms of th- of that of that visual, and that would be your only takeaway. Because it, and I remember in the movie, it was they beat him and they beat him and they beat him and they beat him, and everybody was quiet in the theater. And then when you thought it was over, then they turned him over, and that's when people stopped being quiet and they started sobbing in the theater. And I recall, and I know that we've bought that we bought that movie because we figured that's what good Christians do. We have it; the plastic's still on it. That's that's not the kind of movie you just pop popcorn and say, "Ooh, let's watch the Passion of the Christ." It's like you got to get you got to get ready for that. It, it, there's a brutality that's there. there. There is some some of it is 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 literally spectacle. And, and in Matthew 27 in verse 39 it says, "And that they passed by, they reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself.'" If thou be the son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, also the chief priest mocking him with the scribes and elders said, he saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him come down now from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now. If he will have him, for he said, I am the son of God. The thieves also, which were crucified with them, with him, cast the same, the scripture says, in his teeth. They will run in their mouth too. And so there's a there's a there's a there's a huge uh, spectacle um, that, that that is there. Um, 
uh, and, and, and you could have, like I said, she, almost like a almost like a, a reality show. In Matthew 27, 29, it says, and when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit upon him, and they took the reed and smote him on the head. And after they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. And just so you know, that these thorns that they're talking about are not some little thorns like this little that you find on a rose bush that are really really long thorns and they didn't just neatly just put it on his head they put it on and they jammed it down and so the brutality of the cross we don't see it I don't want to show it to you visually but I do want us to have some kind of appreciation for what it was and to understand that to the world it was simply Friday night Let's go to the crucifixion. Let's see who gets crucified tonight. Let's see what happens. It was, it was a massive spectacle and no idea that there's a savior there. No idea that the sins of the world are being paid for. And many times that's the same way that the world will treat church and they will treat the expression of faith that we have as we come on a, on a, on a Sunday morning. To them, church is just spectacle. I came because I want to see some other shorties up in the house and see what they look like. Who's got on what today? I want to be able to see the choir and I like the music. I don't mind a decent message, but nothing's going to change in my life. I'm just enjoying the spectacle is what we do. Hey, let's just go to church. Which church we want to go? Let's go to this one. I heard they have a banging choir. Let's go over here. They serve the best fried chicken on the west side spectacle but no relationship no no pushing in no no doing more than that but just observing and going about your life because you don't understand what's really happening and for most of the folks that saw the crucifixion that's what it was it was just spectacle and then there's another group that's there and they're around the cross and, and they have a different vantage point. These are the Jews. To the Jews, Calvary was not spectacle. Calvary is, I mean was, excuse me, and is a stumbling block. To the Jews, Calvary is a stumbling block. What am I saying to you? Look in first Peter chapter two, seven through nine. And it says unto you, therefore, which believe he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word being disobedient, whereupon also they were appointed. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who brought you out of darkness into his what? marvelous light there's a story that goes uh, that, that when they were building the temple in Jerusalem originally the, the, one of the most important stones that you can have is what the, is the cornerstone and so that they were in the building project they were building and, and early on in the project they sent from the quarry they sent the they sent the, the cornerstone and the stone came and they and it got delivered to the temple site but but the builders that were there didn't recognize that it was the cornerstone and it was literally in the way and so it got pushed to the side it got pushed out of the way and literally i think they said it got pushed and then kind of went down a little bit of a hill and so now at the end they're, they're waiting for the cornerstone so they send word to the quarry send down the cornerstone and the quarry is like we sent that cornerstone to you weeks ago or years ago or months ago or whatever the timing was and they didn't recognize that the stone that they had rejected the stone that they kept tripping on was literally the cornerstone that's the mental image you have to have the Jews were always looking for the Messiah if you are the Messiah tell us plainly 
They wanted to know, and Jesus would not give them the satisfaction. He said, you wicked and adulterous generation, you always are seeking after a sign. You always want a sign, but, but, but if you don't believe me, at least believe the miracles that I do. At least they, they testify of me. I and my father are one. And every time Jesus affirmed who he was, the religious leaders and those that were around, they, they couldn't understand it. And many times they tried to kill him for it. And they kept, that's the, that's the problem with, a, uh, 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 with the, uh, the, the Jewish faith. It literally trips every time on Jesus. Every time they want to go somewhere, it's like, wait a minute, hold on. And this is Jesus again. This Messiah, there were 61 major prophecies about the Messiah. 61 major prophecies. Jesus literally fulfilled every last one of them. Stuff you can't orchestrate when somebody predicts 400 years before that you're going to be born in Bethlehem and raised in Nazareth. You can't you can't orchestrate that when you're on the cross and, 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 and you and you ask for something to drink and they give you vinegar or, or, or when they when the scripture says that we read together that they cast lots for his for his clothing. Again, there's 61 major prophecies. And if you just picked out, there's a book by Josh McDowell called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. If you just pick out eight of the uh, of these major prophecies and it's a particular it's a particular eight of them that he does and there's some, some uh, probabilities that you do around that that the likelihood statistically that one person will fulfill just eight of the 61 is one in a billion times a million no excuse me one in a hundred billion times a million which is 10 to the 17th power for you scientific notation people what am I saying? It's a big darn number. One person that could do that statistically is, 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 is virtually impossible. And that's just eight of the 61. And here you have Jesus that fulfills every, every one of these 61 major prophecies, let alone the fact that they could have calculated the Jews when he was supposed to appear. There's this prophecy in Daniel 9 and 27 about the 69 uh, weeks, which talks about 69 years times, times seven years, 483 years when the anointed one will be revealed and then cut off. 173,880 days after the, after the building of the wall was declared in, in, in Nehemiah, they should have been looking for the Savior. That happens in 445 B.C. You go all, way, all the way to A.D. 33 when Jesus is on the, in the triumphal entry. 173,880 days to the day. Palm Sunday. When Jesus says, today is the day, and, and, they, and he's going in, and they're saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who cometh in the name of the Lord. And the religious leaders come to him and say, listen, make your disciples stop calling out to you. And what did he say? He says, if these will hold their peace today, the rocks will cry out because this is the day. A visitation. This is the day. This is the day where the Messiah is revealed. And so every other time you look in scripture, many times somebody would say, you're the Messiah. You're the son of God. And he would tell them, Shh, keep that on the DL. It's not time yet. I'm, it's not time yet. He'd even tell the demons that, Shh, just be quiet. Just go where I told you to go. Amen. And so to the Jews, he continues to be this, this, this stumbling block. You can look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. There's another verse in, in Romans chapter 9. Over and over in Scripture, there is this, 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 this stumbling block for the Jews because they did not recognize he was exactly what they were looking for. And he still is. My barber, Kevin, and I have all have all kind of great conversations he likes to bounce stuff off me from time to time and he wanted to know what I thought about this phenomenon of the black Israelites phenomenon is probably too strong a word of this incident of the black Israelites who had a had a mosque or something on 79th and Stoney something like that anyway he said what do you think about that are black people are we really the, the chosen people I'm like, it doesn't matter. Why? <laughs> it's like you can, you can spend all your time 
trying to strip to say that you, you want to be the chosen people. I, I think we're in a better position now because we're in the body of Christ. And so being chosen uh, as, a, as, a, as a Israelite, they, they, they keep stumbling over Jesus, but we have a, we got a clear shot at him. And as a matter of fact, when you talk about being at the wedding, there's always two people at the wedding. No matter who else is there, it's the bride and the bridegroom. Amen. We're the bride. We're going to be there. We got a good seat at the reception, and it's all about us. Trust me, you want to be in the body of Christ instead of worrying about being a black Israelite. you taking me backwards when you start talking about that. Because first Peter tells me you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We got the better deal in that situation. <laughs> Kevin was like, yeah, P. Sal, I knew you was going to have a. Yeah, it's no, why not care about that? I mean, it's interesting, but it falls in the category for me, which a lot of things do. It's interesting, but irrelevant. That's barbershop talk. Are we the chosen? Yeah, okay, we are. Okay, we're not. But I know this, you better choose him. You better get into the bride of Christ. That's, that's, that's how you know you're going to be at the wedding party because you're with the bride. Amen. But the Jews at Calvary, he always was and always will be a stumbling block. Then there's this third group. It's the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and that crowd that were always tangling with Jesus. For them at Calvary, they thought it was a score. Score. We finally scored. We got this guy. We're tired of him. We can't stand him. He's always doing something. He is we're concerned about killing him. In John chapter 11 and verse 47, it says, Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees at council and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. What just happened earlier in John chapter 11? He raised Lazarus from the dead. That's pretty hard to come behind. And they were like, instead of joining in the celebration that they knew somebody had been graveyard dead for four days and saying, We need to bow down and worship. This, this, he must be the son of God. That's not what that, that's not their response. They gathered and said, what do we? This man doeth many miracles. OK, good point. If we let him alone, all men will believe on him. Good point. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and our nation. We're going to lose our jobs. <laughs> I, I, OK, I, I was going to say that we might actually black black people, and Israelites, but they, these might be the black Israelites here. I changed my mind that quickly. They're going to take away our job. They're not going to look to us anymore. They're going to look to him, and we're going to lose our jobs. And one of them, Caiaphas, being a high priest, said, you don't know anything at all. Don't con no consider it's expedient that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. And they spoke this not of himself. He prophesied that Jesus should die for the nation and not for that nation only, but that they should also gather in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. And it says in verse 53, then from that day forth, they took counsel together how to put him to death. And so you get to Calvary and you see him hanging on the cross. You like, we scored. Go, go. We did it. We got it done. We started to plot out to kill him. We got Judas. We paid Judas the 30 pieces of silver. It's all good. Judas comes back, racked with guilt. They're like, that's on you. We paid you. Get out. You got to carry that. We did what we wanted to do. It was a score for them. It was a score for them. Or so they thought. Amen. Because it didn't hold. <laughs> it didn't hold, but it was a score. They, did, they set out to do. And there was other times, you recall, they took up stones to cast them. It said in John chapter 8, this is after he said, I and my father are one. And they knew he was saying that he was God, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple going through the midst of them and so passed by. Now, you know what I say that when Jesus, when they got him and they got him in the crowd and then they can't get they can't get him. I'm telling you, this is my sanctified but culturally influenced mind. I believe that Jesus, when they tried to trap him, that Jesus moonwalked through the crowd and got away from this. Jesus was just like this. 
and you just can't get him. It's just like, wait, wait, where did Jesus go? And then he's just gone. Because he's like, no man take my life, but I lay it down. And I lay it down to redeem. And you see what we said in the text in John chapter 19. And he said, it's finished. And he gave up his spirit. You're not going to take Jesus before it's time. It's like, I know you want to kill me here. And you tried to kill me here. You thought you had me in the temple there. I moonwalked away from you here. I got out of town there because it's not my time. I say when it's my time. Me and my father, I'm on appointment. And I got a job to do at Calvary. And so even though you think you just scored because you have me hanging on this cross, you don't because you don't get to win. As Alonzo from training day said, we get to win. We win. That's what Jesus was saying. We, you don't score. I score. And so you've got the world and to the world. Calvary was just a spectacle. Amen. To the Jews, Calvary has always been a stumbling block. To the religious leaders, they thought it was a score. And for his followers that were there and alive, Calvary was a shock. Believe it or not, Calvary was a shock. Even though he told them he was going to the cross, they didn't grasp it. He tried to prepare them. He mentions it in John 13, John 14, John 15, John 16, and John 17, right around the, where, where our text is. But they just couldn't, they, couldn't, they couldn't grasp that Jesus was saying, I've got a job to do at Calvary. So they literally were, were, were in shock. Um, he told them in Mark chapter 9, he taught his disciples to say, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him. And after that, he is killed. He shall rise the third day. He didn't just tell him I'm going to die. He told him I'm going to die and I'm coming back. And so when he dies and when, he, when he's before the, the, the Sanhedrin, all of that should have made sense to them. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking you, you wouldn't have been in shock. No, you probably would have been in shock too. Amen. They were with Jesus for three years. He told them. He told them in Mark 9. He told them in Mark 10. And they shall mock him and scourge him and shall spit upon him and shall kill him. And the third day he will rise again. Headline story. I'm going to be killed, but I am coming back. When are you coming back, Jesus? Three days. Long weekend. Memorial Day weekend. Just that extra. I'll be back three days. And they just could not grasp that that's what was happening. It was, it, was, it was so overwhelming. Calvary was a major disruption, beloved, to the flow of what Jesus was doing with his disciples. It was like, we got a good thing here. We follow you. You teach us. We see a whole bunch of great stuff happen. It's exciting when we're around you. And it, it all goes, why you, why you want to go and mess with the program? I'm sure that's what they thought. That's why they were so shocked. This is, a, this is not the program. The program is follow and miracles and, and we get to talk to you and you, we get to be with you by ourselves. But he always told them, one day I will not be with you. And he says, I will have to leave you so that I can stop being beside you and then I can start being in you. That's what he means when he says greater works than these shall you do because I go unto my father. Why? Because I'm going to stop being beside you, walking with you, and I'm literally going to be in you. Colossians 1 and 27 says Christ in you, the hope of glory. He says, I want to be in you. That way I can that, that way I can influence you even more through the Holy Spirit. I will be what in you. And I will be everywhere. At the same time, because I will be in you. I'll be in your body. I'll be, you'll have communion with me that you can't have now. But it can't happen unless I do what? Unless I die, unless I rise again, and then I ascend and go to my father. And you look at, you look at even the, uh, on the Emmaus Road. I love the, the story of the Emmaus Road in Luke chapter 24. Luke 24, starting in verse, I want to say it's verse 17. And Jesus, Jesus kind of sneaks up on them. 
They're walking on the Emmaus Road. The next thing you know, Jesus appears. And he said unto them, Jesus did, what, what is this communication? What are you all talking about as you walk? And, and, and why are you sad? And one of them, Cleopas, which I really believe is Cleophas, but <laughs> another evidence of the black Israelite connection, by the way. Cleophas said, are you a stranger in Jerusalem? And hast thou not known the things which are come to pass concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people? Sounds like they got a pretty good handle on this thing. And how the chief priests and rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been in which he should have been redeemed. He would have redeemed Israel. And besides all this, to Today is the third day since these things were done. So they did actually have a little bit of a grasp, but they were still kind of in a fog. They didn't know. And here's Jesus that's right in front of them. And, and he said, they said, certain women of our company made us astonished because they went to the sepulcher early and they found, they found not his body saying that they, have, they had seen a vision of angels, that he was alive. All of that should make sense. That's what he said was going to happen. And certain of us that were with them, men, went to the sepulcher and found it even as the women had said, but him they saw not. And then Jesus says to them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And that the, I love, this is it, verse 27. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And then he bounced a little bit, a couple of verses later. And they said, how our hearts did burn when he talked with us on the way. That was something about that guy. And how our hearts burned and their eyes were open and they, verse 30, and they knew him. Hmm. And he vanished out of their sight. And they said, did not our hearts burn within us when he talked to us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures. And so they finally got it together, those that were on the Emmaus Road. But again, they were walking around in a, in a, in a fog and shock, his followers. It was an overwhelming experience to see the person that you love now hanging on a cross, knowing that he did nothing wrong except he bucked the system and that they wanted him dead and so if we left there this would not be a very encouraging message it'll be incomplete and it's going to be incomplete because we still have four more people but let me give you at least one more so that we can depart here on a high note amen the fifth person the fifth group that that has a view of calvary are believers amen and i'm i'm hoping this morning that's you Amen. Are, are there any believers in the house? Amen. Th that's why we at least got to end on a note where we talk about your view because you're, you're not the world. So it's not spectacle. You're, you're not the Jews. And so unless there's some black Jews in here, you're not the Jews. So it's not stumbling block. It's, you're not a religious leader. You're not a Pharisee or a Sadducee. So you don't consider Calvary a score. You're, you're not a, you, you, you are a follower, but, but there's only a limited number of followers that were alive at the time. Jesus, and, and so you shouldn't be in shock because now you have the benefit of understanding the power of the cross. Amen. You have the written word of God that explains to you exactly what the power of the cross is and for the believers the the thing that calvary is more than anything else is substitution substitution now when i say the word substitution the first thing i think of is substitution what teacher when you think substitution teacher you think this is going to be a great day because this teacher doesn't know anything. She can't do anything to us. Our regular teacher will be back at some point and I don't have to listen or worry. But substitute teacher is like, we got a substitute today. It's going to be on all day in homeroom substitute. That's not the kind of substitution we're talking about here. This is not the blow off uh, substitution. This is serious substitution that, that, that without this substitution, you, you and I are not, we're not here. Amen. 
that, that this is this is what I would describe as as exciting substitution because second Corinthians 5 and 21 says this this is substitution that I'm talking about and this is why you should be excited and and and, and if you needed some guidance and direction on when you should shout in a message this is the shout this is the shout section this is the shout time substitution Amen. equals shout don't shout for score. Don't 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 shout for stumbling block. Don't 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 shout for spectacle and don't and, 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 and don't shout for shock. But you should shout for substitution because second Corinthians five tells us he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might become the righteousness of God in him parentheses shout. That's that, that, that right there, that right there. He made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Shout why? Because there's a substitution of sinfulness for righteousness. Amen. That's what puts you and I in the game with God. It's because he made a substitution of our sin for his righteousness. And now we're clothed in Christ's righteousness, which allows us to stand before God in relationship. Amen. That's justification. Amen. We are delivered uh, from the penalty of sin through justification and through sanctification in an ongoing relationship. We are delivered from the power of sin and then in glorification when we get there. I'm sorry, I'm on a different message now. It will be, we'll be delivered from the very presence of sin. You see how comprehensive the cross is? Delivered from the penalty of sin, the power of sin. And the presence of sin, justification, sanctification, glorification, all made possible because he is the substitute. Amen. Substitute. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. That, that's you. Amen. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commended his love towards us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's substitution. That's substitution. First Peter 2, 24. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to stands should live unto righteousness by whose stripes we are healed. Sinfulness got substituted by righteousness because he went to the cross for us. And first, first John, I believe it says that he and he is the propitiation and not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole and the cross is available for everybody but it's only effective for those that believe and I want you to note that that on that day at the cross there that, uh, that day at Calvary as we close there'll be there were three crosses that were there and and, and it really it, it really uh, it really details the two of the crosses uh, look at, 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 at our response to Jesus and one is what Jesus did for us but but there were but there were three crosses that day. He said, and, and when they and, and when they crucified him, the other two were with him on either side, and Jesus was in the midst. And I want to say it's it's Luke chapter twenty three that gives them and gives this gives us the detail. And it does. It's, it's in Luke chapter 23. And, and, there, and one of the, <laughs> verse 39 says, and one of the malefactors which were hanged next to him railed on him, saying, if thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. Yeah, I don't know anything about you, but I don't want to be hanging here 
Crucifixion was gruesome. It could take you 60, 80 hours to, to die because you literally were dying from suffocation. Up and down, up and down. You're trying to shift your weight in your, in your hands and in the holes in your hands and your feet are getting bigger and bigger and it's more difficult to breathe up and down, up and down. And eventually you just can't, you can't keep it up, but it takes a while. It was gruesome. It was a spectacle. And the spectacle was really over when they come by and they break your legs. Because if they break your legs, then you just hang. You don't have any way to push up and get any air in your lungs. And so leg breaking was what happened when it was, the spectacle was over. They were ready to go. It's taking too long. They break your legs and then it's over. But they, didn't came, they came by to break Jesus' legs, but they didn't realize he had already given up his spirit. Amen. But, but the, one of those thieves said... If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. But the other one answered and rebuked him, saying, Don't you fear God, seeing that thou art in the same condemnation? We, what we did, we did justly. That's, that's justice. We, we deserve to be here. For we received the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing wrong. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Come on, didn't he pick up, the, he picked up that church language quick, didn't he? Lord, Rememberest thou me whenest thou comest intoest thine kingdomness? And Jesus said unto him, Today, I, verily I say unto you, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. That means that that you see there's the contrast of, of those three, those three crosses. That 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 first cross, that first guy, that's the cross of rejection. He died in sin. Come on, man, help us out. Help a brother out. You get down and get us down too. But he had no belief. He just said, I need to get out of a jam. I need to get out of a circumstance. That's how a lot of people look at God. God is like, 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 like the, like, you know, break in case of emergency. And then when the emergency's over, I, I don't need God. I'm not trying to make him Lord of my life. I don't even want him to be my savior. I just need him to help me out of a jam when I, when I need to get out of a jam. And then I'm back to doing what I do. That's the cross of rejection. That, that thief died in sin. But then there's also the cross that, that you and I can, can relate a lot to. That's the cross of, of, of uh, reception. Because that other thief, he died to sin. Amen. He was like, I don't want to be who I, I want to be with you. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. That was an expression of faith that, 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 that Jesus received and said, you know what? You're going to be with me today in paradise. That's the cross of reception. He died to sin. The other one died in sin. And in the middle cross, you have Jesus. That's the cross of redemption. He died for sin. So when you have that view of Calvary as a believer, it's all about substitution. He died for sin. And you want to make sure that, that, you, are, that you have the right kind of uh, response to Jesus. You don't want to die in sin. You want to die to sin because he died for sin. What do you want to do today? Is church just going to be a spectacle? Something you can tweet out about? choir was fire today put the little fire emoji on and don't let anything happen during the week don't don't read your bible don't don't fellowship don't pray don't talk to god don't let him be lord of your life you just here for the spectacle you just here for the show no you have to understand the view of Calvary that you and I have to have is, is substitution, sinfulness for righteousness and as we have Christ's righteousness we need to walk in it that's what this is all about. That's the right view for you and I. Next time, I'm going to tell you about Satan's view, Christ's view, and God the Father's view of Calvary. So if you want to know, you need to get here to see. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and we praise you for this day. We th